Hi everyone, it's Dan Pingham with Lakers Consulting. I recently had the opportunity to speak to the maintenance forum, which was taking place in Port Harcourt, Nigeria. So it was a, a pleasure for me to be able to talk internationally, although remote, and to review some concepts that I experienced as part of doing a maintenance transformation and applying the five dysfunctions of a team model by Patrick Lencioni to that situation. Uh, the team at the Maintenance Institute Africa was kind enough to record that and have made that recording available for me to share to other people in my network. And so that's what this video is all about. Just doing a brief intro to try and set the stage for you. So we use the five dysfunctions of a team model by Lencioni in this case. Uh, we were applying it at a plant in which we were doing mineral extraction uh, from water, from the Great Salt Lake, actually. And that operation needed to improve its performance by changing the approach that they were using to keep their plant and equipment healthy. And so we went through a pretty involved change exercise to do that. Uh, and touched on the elements of the model of the five dysfunctions of the team along the way. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that and how it applied, talk about the model itself. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a chance to do a recap and uh, do some sharing. The model comes from the five dysfunctions of a team by Patrick Lencioni. He's a uh, consultant with the table group has been at it for a long, long time. Uh, this mo this uh, model was written as a leadership fable, similar to what you might see in the goal or the gold mine, if you've read those books, in which they use a fictional situation to demonstrate the concepts that they were using. So in this case, it was a failing tech business um, that needed to do some pretty significant improvement and changes from a founder state to one that's being run by a CEO put in place. Uh, and the changes and necessarily modifications of the team and how the team behaved with each other were very important to making that switch. Uh, the book also includes a summary model that shows the steps along the way. So you can uh, read the fiction, get the gist of what the model's all about, and then go to the back and you'll see the model and the steps uh, that you would use to apply it in your situation. Uh, the book was originally published in 2002 and an accompanying field guide was published in 2005 after uh, the copies kept going out the door and Lencioni was getting requests on how could, how could people use the model and apply it. So he provided some more detail in that field guide. And to this point, over 3 million copies in 30 languages have been sold. So it's been a far reaching book. So I thank you for taking some time out to check out this video. We're gonna roll into the footage from the actual session that we did at the maintenance forum right now. And you can, you can join in with the team and, and see how, uh, how it was presented on that day. Thanks so much for taking a moment out of your day to, to review this. Have a great day. So let's talk a little bit more about an overview of the five dysfunctions of a team. And I'd like to focus on the left-hand side of this slide, or what do we need to do to be a high-performing team with, with the group of individuals charged with, in most of our cases, uh, keeping the assets of our operations healthy. As we all know, and I know you've talked a lot about technologies that can, that can assist you in making your operations more reliable, achieve more throughput, reach the business results you're after. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need people to execute that technology. So we can't ignore the fact that we all need to work together to be more successful. And you see some of those successful traits here on the left side of the, of the, uh, of the slide. It all starts with trust. You have to build a foundation of trust. So it's, it's no coincidence that the bottom of the or base of that pyramid is a, a foundation building up and overcoming lack of trust. So for a high performing team, we want people who are willing 
and see it as a strength to ask for help. They share their weaknesses and help each other. And they believe that everyone is trying their best to make a successful operation. Once we start to overcome hiding mistakes and making assumptions and holding grudges and move to that left side of the, of the slide you see here, we can then move up to the next level. That is addressing fear of conflict. So that's making sure we're having healthy debates when we're trying to make decisions as a group. Uh, we're working things out together. And if there is some issue with behavior within the group, we feel free to challenge it and address it very early on. We don't let it, uh, we don't let it grow and become worse over time. As we move up to the next level, uh, it's making sure the team is committed. So it's having clear objectives and priorities, making sure we've got, we've got uh, I would say, a minimum amount of buy-in from the team. Obviously, you want as much buy-in as you can get. Uh, but as we're working through these team dynamics, uh, each individual might be at a slightly different stage. So we've got to recognize that and address that. As we've built a, count, a, a built commitment, we then move to accountability. So how do we hold each member of the team accountable, deal with the poor performance, make sure that we have common standards and people know the work they're supposed to do, understand it, own it, make sure it gets done. Finally, if we're doing all that right, we're going to be targeting a common set of results that shows the team successful. It's focused on those team results, hitting those objectives, uh, and making sure we have a highly motivated team moving in the same direction. So I'm sure as you're, as you're looking at this model and you're thinking about it, you can certainly see uh, this applied to successful teams in athletics that most of us have all been exposed to. If they're working together to reach those results, the goal is the success of the team, not necessarily the success of individuals on that team. Let's talk a bit more about how I was involved in a transformational event at a facility and how uh, the Lencioni model, the five dysfunctions, can be applied to it. And what we did to address some of those certain situations. Now, I would say that this is a little bit uh, looking backwards at applying the model rather than being as conscious as we could be in applying it as part of this transformation. And I think that's one lesson to take, uh, take away from this example is to make sure you're conscious in making changes and addressing resistance amongst your team to getting there. Yeah, we did do uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of steps to try and mitigate uh, issues with our team. And I'll talk through some of those and how they're applied. But, but I think having this model, which I didn't have at the time, uh, and you having it in your hands as you're engaging and trying to make meaningful change to your operations to improve performance and having a set group of people you're trying to do that with, having this model can, can help you out uh, in a significant way. So in this example case, uh, it happens to be a mineral extraction facility in Utah, that, which is in the Western United States. And uh, they use solar ponds to concentrate minerals out of water from the Great Salt Lake. And that concentration takes place in three steps. The first step is dropping salt, good old sodium chloride, out of solution as uh, it is as the brine is cooked in ponds over the course of a couple of years. Uh, that brine is then pumped off to another set of ponds, and the remaining salt that's dropped out of solution is extracted, similar to uh, how you would do things in an open pit mine, a very shallow open pit mine, because these ponds are only a few feet deep. And so that salt in the U.S. is used for uh, road safety. We put salt on the roads in the wintertime to um, melt the snow. That's where the bulk of it goes. It also goes to things like water conditioning, uh, animal nutrition, um, and, and some, other, uh, some other applications. The next step in those ponds from an evaporation standpoint uh, is dropping sulfate of potash or potassium sulfate out of solution. Uh, that takes about another year. And again, we pump off the brine to another set of ponds. That potassium sulfate left behind is extracted as you would, again, in an open pit mine, but it is further 
uh, process to make sure there's conversion to a full, uh, a, a highly um, valuable fertilizer. So it's more like a chemical plant operation downstream of the extraction. And that's where the majority of profits comes from in this operation. And then finally, the remaining brine is either made into magnesium chloride for, for other uses, or now the, the facility is actually starting to use that brine to also extract lithium. And as we know, electric vehicles are taking off all around the world. That lithium is going to batteries. So that's a, a new application for that facility. So they're getting multiple uses out of this brine. But at the time, uh, sulfate of potash was really the key product. They were sold out, high margin. They want to make sure that they minimize disruptions to operations. And they were having operational issues and they kept putting more money into maintenance, but it wasn't yielding results. So they, they, there was a burning platform. We got to do something different. Um, they increased spending. Uh, they share that maintenance resource across the multiple production units I just described. Uh, there's about 250 employees across the operation with about 75 of those somehow involved in the health of that facility in terms of maintenance, reliability, and stores. Of course, not to mention the people who run that equipment on a daily basis to make these minerals, the operations folks. Um, site leadership knew they had done uh, all they could with what they had. More money wasn't fixing the problem. They needed to take a different approach, and they asked for some help to make changes, which is part of how I was involved as an internal driver of continuous improvement. So hopefully that sets the stage for why we might need to make some changes in how we do things and how this model uh, could be applied. So just to just to make things a, a, a little bit more clear on the model we were trying to develop from an asset care, maintaining and reliability standpoint, um, it was converting from break fix to something where we had planned work and planned reliability efforts. So uh, we went a step at a time in this process. First was making sure we knew what work we needed to do through uh, work identification and uh, control. And that's making sure the work is justified and worth the cost to do it. Um, so, try, so any place where we had a choice, we made sure we did an evaluation. We were also very highly reactive at this point. We were doing more than 15% of our hours in maintenance on reactive maintenance, break fix, call outs, as you all know from working in industrial maintenance, that tends to be the highest cost maintenance um, that you that you can have. You would much rather fix something that's broken on your terms than fix something that's that's broken on the equipment's terms, which always seems to happen at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So it was making sure we had a process for identification and approval and discussion of work before it happened up front. We then moved to planning. So any work we had the opportunity with, with time uh, to make sure we had a solid work plan. We knew how many people, what pieces and parts, uh, how long it was going to take. Step two, really ironing out that planning process and dedicating people to planning, not just having people who are titled as planners, as parts wranglers. Uh, once we had planning set, it was moving to scheduling, stacking up those work orders in a given week, comparing it to the resources you had available and laying out what could be done. Also, as you might imagine, we're still reactive trying to become proactive. So you still had to dedicate some amount of your team to doing that reactive work while you're trying to fix the root cause of that reactive work. So a challenge. As we look, this, this facility had multiple large turnarounds or shutdowns during the year where you needed equipment down to do that uh, very involved uh, preventative work. And so we would also be stacking up work orders, plan it, plans, turn that schedule into a shutdown schedule where we had activities stacked up in a Gantt chart to know what was going to happen when, building that discipline. Um, along with planning and scheduling, we also had work to do in the storeroom. So being able to talk that part on hand prior to scheduling the work because we didn't want people to be waiting for parts when we had control of that work. 
So that changed the whole discipline in our storeroom facility to uh, have a strong tie between uh, that team and the maintenance team to get orders in place, to have lead times, to have base level of stock for things that had more frequent breakdown so we wouldn't have to go through that order cycle uh, and really change the discipline to bring the total cost of the storeroom down. So we wouldn't have uh, a replacement plant sitting on the shelves, so to speak. As we were doing those things in parallel, we were also building up our reliability skill set. So that meant we brought onto the site thermography, vibration analysis, oil analysis, ultrasound, motor circuit analysis, et cetera, and had to build some skill sets and disciplines and know what we could do internally and know what we needed some outside help to do. Um, and we'll revisit some of those technologies in a little bit. So that's the model we're trying to strive for. And after being a reactive plant for almost 50 years, changing that model, uh, we had a lot of organizational inertia that the team had to overcome. And that leads us into what we needed to do next with the model. So thinking back to Lencioni's five dysfunctions, the first, that, that base of that pyramid is absence of trust. And so just to recap that, when, when you're in an organization where you have that, you have a failure to understand what's going on with other folks on the team. And you also fail to open up to each other and be vulnerable and ask for help. So it's building that sense of security and trust to be able to move forward. Um, because of that lack of trust, there often aren't very constructive debates on a team. Uh, you're either not debating or you're pointing fingers and doing blame. And we've got to build that base, that trust base, to be able to move up to the next level in our in addressing our dysfunctions. So let's talk about what we did in our mineral extraction plant example. The first thing was we tried to break down silos within the organization. So we formed a project team with cross-functional representation within that team. Uh, representing each piece of the uh, operations of trying to get that mineral from brine to the customer. So as you would imagine, we had representation from our maintenance team, which include management, planning, scheduling, supervision, and the maintainers themselves. From operations, the people who are the ones charged with Running that equipment to produce those minerals, we had representation from management, uh, from operators, and also a role in this particular model called production maintenance coordinator, who was the voice of operations to maintenance and reliability and helped set priorities from a single point on the operation side. So he, he was, in essence, the, um, the uh coordinator of all the work coming in that was to be planned and scheduled. Uh, we still had a, a an emergency loop for anything that was break fixed, but anything we had some decision-making capability over, it went through the production maintenance coordinator. Uh, we also had team members for reliability, which included reliability engineering and uh, reliability technicians who were the ones to go out in the field and actually do uh, reliability routes in thermography, ultrasound, vibration, et cetera. To get um, support from other parts of the organization, we brought in uh, a team from stores, which included, in our case, procurement, the people who are actually going out and placing orders and, and managing lead times, uh, and, and uh, the management of that group, plus the technicians who ran the storeroom on a day-to-day -day basis to restock parts, and also to begin uh, the evolution of a kitting process. So we, if we're going to plan and schedule work, we know when that work's going to happen. We don't want our maintainers to go on a treasure hunt each and every day. We had our storeroom actually kit work for planned work orders and get it in place. So uh, when the maintainers were ready to do the work, the parts were there for them to execute that work. And then finally, we had some consulting resources. I was one of those internally. Uh, we asked, also said some external help uh, with the model we were putting in place 
and also some day-to-day -day facilitation and coaching because this was a big effort trying to manage this change across the organization with uh, multiple different people. That team that we put together built a change management plan. And so part of what we did was to um, walk through the reasons why for the change as a cross-functional group, understand what's the business reasons for doing something different compared to what the history had been and focusing on value. And so we developed that into what we call a common elevator speech or a pitch. So if somebody who had not been involved in the effort came up and spoke to a team member, they could easily describe what are we doing and why. So in our case, we developed a rationale or case for change, which was that we were a growing site and we needed to make the best use of those assets uh, to satisfy the customers who, who kept saying we need more fertilizer. Um, one way to do that was to improve the equipment reliability uptime, so be producing more in the same amount of time and the work processes that go along with it. And then to reinforce as part of that rational case for change is we've done a lot with all the people who have worked here historically with good people and doing hard work, but that hard work was no longer enough. We needed to do smart work. We had needed to add good process to the mix to ensure that we were able to compete for the long haul to satisfy those customers and keep our plant and equipment and people healthy. So the rationale was, was about that. From a vision perspective, what would it look like when we were done? Uh, we were implementing this new program. It consisted of a disciplined and well-understood work order management process, a reliability engineering effort, and excellence from our stores and, and MRO. Uh, that meant that we were trying to transition um, to greater than 85% of our maintenance work hours being planned and scheduled and identifying equipment issues, fixing them prior to a failure when you have that incipient failure picked up by reliability tools and managing the stores effectively to balance costs versus parts availability. And also there's a what's in it for me as an individual component as part of that vision. Uh, as a maintainer, what would that mean to me? It might mean that I don't get called out in the middle of the night all the time when I would rather be spending time with my family. Um, it may mean that uh, the parts are there when I when I go to pick up a planned job. Uh, it means that I have less stress as part of the work. It means that the overall organization is not under the stress. Um, so, so it's also important in that vision to know what an individual is going to get out of that change that goes along with the organization. And then we also talked about the beans to the end, the three to five key actions we were starting on then to make this happen, uh, which was getting that team established, implementing our processes, making sure that we showed leadership commitment to following the model and having that leadership act as a steering team, uh, building a reliability team because we had very limited resource there, and then scrutinizing what we did in stores and making sure that we had improvements there as well. So laying that all that whole case for change, common elevator speech, being able to share that across the organization was very important. It also pulled the team together. So there were some great benefits from that. So let's keep talking about the Lencioni model. And dysfunction two or failure mode two is the fear of conflict. And in those cases, if you have a team that's in this stage and they haven't They've developed the trust, but they're still trying to get beyond uh, what do we need to do as a group uh, to, to uh, debate, come together, perhaps butt heads in a more, uh, in a more crude uh, wording, um, is, is to get comfortable with having that conflict and making sure it's constructive. So oftentimes if you're not there, you have artificial harmony. People get in the room and they feel like you know they go through the motions of having a discussion but and they pretend to agree but they don't really agree there might be some tension when they're having conversation but ultimately there's no real debate to come up with the best solution from the whole team and as a result people retreat to their individual functional silos so in this case you might have maintenance supervision going back to to their offices or to their workplace and doing what they think is right based on uh, their own agendas instead of agreeing to after some debate 
what the team as a whole really needs and what their component is in making that happen. So there's a, a, a real key importance in knowing, and we get into this a bit more in, a, in accountability, but knowing whose roles do what and making sure that those roles all contribute to the success of the team. So in our case, how did we address that fear of conflict? Well, we step through all those actions that I mentioned as part of our key actions in our case for change um, in, our, in our elevator speech and how those asset health models would be implemented a step at a time. So if you think back to the asset model where we had work order ID and control, planning, scheduling, uh, shutdown coordination, MRO, excellence, et cetera, each one of those had components of work that we had to uh, master. And we went through that a step at a time. And we didn't proceed fully to the next step until we were good enough at the prior step to make sure there was value in moving ahead. Um, we had consultants acting as coaches throughout the process and, and reminding people, yes, we need to do it this way. The heroic, reactive way is not the way of the future, the low-cost way, the successful way. Uh, it may feel good from an adrenaline standpoint because we all like heroes, but it's not the best way to run a continuously operating facility. Um, so we were there to provide some reinforcement. And we did daily check-ins um, with the complete team to identify and drive and prove that coordination. You know, did we have the parts to meet the schedule or not? Uh, was the reliability team identifying any new failures that we needed to put into the work order queue, et cetera. So it was building up that, that daily discussion. What are the issues? How do we fix them as a group that was so important? Back to the model. Level three, failure mode three, is lack of commitment. So this is really around... Um, not fully committing to a plan and executing on the follow through. Uh, it's not having agreement without ambiguity or making sure we have clear agreement as to what the next steps are, who's doing them and when they're going to be done. As part of this commitment, as we debate it, as we just saw in the prior dysfunction, everybody should have a chance to voice their opinion and provide some input so the team can understand and support the, the path forward, even if an individual doesn't personally agree with it. So at the end of the day, we're not really trying to build consensus. We're trying to make sure everybody's viewpoints out there. We pick the best solution as a team, even if that might not be the best solution that an individual uh, agreed to or wanted to promote. In other words, that's disagree, have that debate, and then commit to the group solution. Because if we're meeting on a daily basis, that means if something doesn't go as planned, we have a chance to regroup, discuss, and course correct if needed. So if you think of it in terms of the, the, the Deming wheel, plan, do, check, act, uh, you know, we've planned, we've done it, we're now checking it, and we're acting for correction if needed. So how did our team address this lack of commitment? Uh, to, to get over it. So we, as I mentioned earlier, we're meeting daily. We also met weekly in terms of sorting through work and understanding what work is in the backlog, what needs to happen next. And we would lay that out in terms of a, a plan, overlay that plan with resource availability, develop a schedule for the next week and work through those larger issues of executing work and then tracking progress. And we'll talk a bit more about progress when we, when we get into results. We would make sure that as we executed steps within our asset care approach, uh, that we were successful before moving along to the next one. So as you might imagine, this was not a few week kind of process. This was a multi-year effort to change the culture and approach of this facility. And we wanted to make sure that we were successful at each step along the way to build that culture. And we had regular reviews in it and meetings with the team to make sure we were actually executing to the plan and making progress. 
And part of the reason for having these meetings was to make sure that we were, uh, in some respects, forcing debate amongst the team members, discussion amongst the team members, and ensuring people did not go back to those silos. Because in an organization that's been doing things the same way for 50 years, there's a lot of inertia, a lot of pullback to the old way, unless you're out there actively making sure the new way becomes a habit. So again, it's repeated progress, slow steps over time, uh, and then some positive reinforcement. We'll talk about results here in a moment. Failure mode four, avoidance of accountability. So if you ha now have clarity and buy-in for a plan, so in this case, executing the model change, be becoming proactive from reactive, each member has the power and ability to hold others accountable, their peers accountable for what they've signed up to do and for having high standards and performing that behavior. Each team member as part of that process has to become accustomed to having some discomfort when both calling out other team members and being called out, knowing that the real motivation for that is not a, a blame or uh, an attack, it's to make sure that the overall team is successful. So that's why going back to that baseline of trust at the beginning is so important to have that first before moving ahead. And then as we go through, we wanna make sure we have regular updates and tracking of actions. And that allows us to step in if we need to do some course correction. And that might be a process issue or that might be a, a, a personal execution issue. Uh, but it's making sure we we have these things in place to make sure um, the team is doing what each one of them is supposed to bring to that ultimate team result. So if, if you're thinking about perhaps a football team, there's different roles depending on what spot on the field somebody plays. It's the same sort of idea here within our organization. So let's get back to how did we address it in our case. Um, a good thing for us was the model we were putting in place from a transition from reactive to proactive had clear responsibilities for each role. So we had roles around who was responsible for generating work orders or work order requests, who approved those requests and turned them into work orders, and how did we set priority? Uh, that was largely within the uh, production maintenance coordinator's realm um, and, uh, and ultimately approval to enter the planning queue. We had dedicated planners. And oftentimes in the industrial facilities I've worked around, we have people we call planners, but they end up being the, the uh, go-to person for everything in maintenance. They might be a fill-in supervisor. They might be somebody ordering parts. They might be somebody uh, chasing down uh, workers, whatever the case may be. Uh, but in this model, it was very important to have clear maintenance planning responsibility with some metrics around planning. How many plans can you develop in a week? And not to get distracted by the other things that are so often the case in uh, larger organizations because the planner becomes expert at a lot of things and they often become the person that's the first call to answer a question which is not really a direct um, part of their, their daily work. Uh, so they get distracted and can't do the things that they need to do. And if you look at the studies around planning, um, Planning uh, is, the, is the best way to improve the wrench time of your maintainers and turn it from what's typically 35 to 40% in 75 to 80% time actually doing work. So it's important to dedicate people to that role. We would also then do scheduling. So we, scheduling was a combination of planners providing a uh, stacked list of plans and supervision knowing who they had available to do the work in the next weekly bucket. And lining those two up and then executing to that schedule was maintenance supervision's responsibility. Ordering and purchasing agents. And we also had people responsible for receiving, putting parts on the shelf. And then as we developed our plans and schedules and providing that to the storeroom, them kidding work ahead of execution. So having the stack of work order parts ready to go, kitted by work order, 
So the maintainers could come in the next day, see the schedule, know the work, find the work order, find the parts and go execute. That's where you get that benefit of an improvement in wrench time, not having to do the, to do the treasure hunt for parts each and every day. Execution was largely on uh, the maintainers and the maintainer's supervision to make sure things were being done and to handle any um, any upsets during that process, because as you all know, we often find things when we open up equipment that even the best plan may not have expected based on the best history of prior work. So you've got to be able to, to, to roll with some of those surprises as you go and make sure you execute and track reasons for changes in your execution versus plan. And then finally, we had some responsibilities around proactive monitoring that really gets into the predictive tools and who was responsible for what, um, technicians versus engineering, uh, setting up routes and managing those routes and managing things we found, uh, doing early detection via thermography, ultrasound, vibration, et cetera, turning that early detection into a work order, which then follow, flows through the same process I just described, um, and also tracking good health as well. So the model, the asset care model we were putting in, into place had defined roles and responsibilities for all of that. And people knew where they fit in. And they, I think as an ongoing concern, we had to always resist that inertia to be pulled back to a firefighting mode from, a, from the proactive process we were trying to build. Because if you think about it, we often reward those heroes for coming in and doing those amazing fixes in the middle of the night. But to be truly successful, we don't want to have to have that be the case. We want things to run. We want to take down and maintain on our, our plan and schedule versus the equipment's plan and schedule. So having those early detection methodologies in place is very important to buy you that time. Because if you look at the P to F curve, you know, you often have weeks to months after that incipient failure takes place to do the correction. If you wait for the equipment to tell you when it's hot and making lots of noise, you then have typically hours to fix it. So you want to get ahead of it if you can. So we defined what roles and responsibilities were to address avoidance of accountability and making sure somebody could not point the finger at somebody else on the team. So if we've done all that correctly, the last failure mode we have to uh, address is inattention to results. So we've done all the things right. We know who's doing what. We know when they're doing them. Uh, but if we aren't still focused as a team, there can be a tendency for individual team members to seek out attention for what they do to get better uh, it, it, and seek recognition at the expense of the team, which at the end of the day, um, if we're not all getting those lagging results, the team's not successful. Um, so we want to make sure we're, we're recognizing the results of the team and the individual efforts that go into reaching those results. Inattention to results can be overcome by ensuring that the collective ego of the team is greater than the individual egos of the each team member. We want to make sure that as we're going through and trying to develop the results we want, that we pick clear metrics to determine when we're winning. And those net metrics need to be based on the team, such as production rate, uh, reliability, profitability, could be equipment health measures, it's, it could be OEE, what, whatever the case may be, it has to be something that has the whole group supporting it. Now, I would point out that oftentimes these types of uh, metrics are lagging and they you only know you're successful at the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month. And you need to have like the things like uh, schedule compliance. If I've got a schedule for the next week, how how what percentage of work did I complete? It might be things like um, our emergency work order count or emergency work order hours during the week. Uh, you want those to be as low as possible if uh, within reason. Um, 
So you need to have a mix of leading and lagging. You also want to check in on that progress regularly. So that usually means looking at leading indicators on a weekly or daily basis. And you, you want them to remember that the metrics are in appropriate time increments and you have time to adjust course correct with actions before that period's over. Uh, so if you're looking at weekly schedule compliance, you might be wanna, you might want to be looking at it on a daily basis to see am I tracking to hit my total weekly numbers? And do I have time to do some course correction if, uh, if something's not tracking right in day two of the week? So in our case, we establish metrics like schedule compliance, reactive hours percentage versus proactive hours percentage, equipment availability on an hours basis, equipment health. And in our case, we were looking at uh, basically a map of our operations where equipment was placed and what percentage of equipment had an open work order against it. Um, so that was a measure of our health. Uh, from a stores perspective, you can look at service levels and stockouts. Are the parts there when I need them? Are the parts there when they were supposed to be from an ordering perspective? And then a real high level uh, lagging metric, probably one that should only be looked at once a year at most is the maintenance cost as a percent of replacement asset value, because that's really where all in three and 10%, but within industries, it can vary greatly. So oftentimes it's measuring against yourself and showing some improvement. I did want to spend a moment on this slide uh, looking at the graphic uh, because it illustrates a few things. One, it illustrates that this was a uh, concerted effort over a long period of time. You see, we've got five years of history there. Uh, the blue line represents the percent of predictive hours, the time spent going out and looking for incipient failures in our, in our plant and equipment. The red line represents the percentage of hours that were emergency work orders, true reactive hours. There's no planning involved. It's just something is broken, we're down, we need to go fix it. And historically, as you can see, we were somewhere up above 25%, sometimes hitting close to 30% over the course of this effort. And it was worse prior to beginning the effort. And so starting to do the work, creating a running inspection program, walking through and looking at historic preventive maintenance tasks and holding those up against the lens of the um, operational modes that the, those pieces of equipment were in versus what just a standard manufacturer is going to tell you needs to be done with no knowledge of what you're using the equipment for and eliminating PMs that really didn't provide any value. And then ultimately key um, improvements in this particular effort was around the use of ultrasound and, and doing ultrasound inspection as part of regular reliability monitoring loops around the facility. And this, there's lots of rotating equipment in this facility, so this technology made sense. Uh, it was when they put that in place, they saw a very dramatic change in reactive versus proactive hours because they were picking up those incipient failures they hadn't before using that technology. And so that just made a very significant difference and uh, how they were ultimately able to spend time and be successful as a facility. Um, so all facilities are different. That might not work for yours, but I just did want to point it out that there, there did happen to be a, a, a combination of technologies and one specific technology that led to some pretty significant changes in, in a positive way in results for that, for that plan. So let's do a quick recap. And how do we apply these technologies? We needed to manage that change in that facility to drive improvement. We also needed to manage the dysfunction amongst the team to try and get out from that historic inertia, addressing reliability and cost improvement at, at the facility. We applied the model to our, to our team. 
driving improvement and trust by creating a team and a change management plan, addressing fear of conflict, and then having coaching and monitoring to make sure we were driving constructive conflict, addressing lack of commitment by having frequent meetings and updates and making sure people were signed on for what they needed to do, addressing accountability by knowing who was supposed to do what in terms of roles and responsibilities, having those clear roles for the organization and individual team members, and then driving results by having ways to track it. Uh, what gets measured gets done, in other words. And so putting those clear metrics in place, sharing them frequently, knowing what we needed to do to tweak them to make sure that the leading metrics were getting us to the lagging metrics that showed ultimate success. So as a takeaway, we were able to successfully apply the model. In this case, we held our cost steady, which was an improvement uh, because we changed our approach. Uh, oftentimes you have a hump, you've got to do two things at once and the costs go up before they can go down. Uh, we improved availability of equipment, decreased the stress on the individuals trying to maintain, uh, detect, manage the plant, and ultimately secured additional investment for the site. And as I said, they're moving into a different type of mineral extraction within the lith lithium space, which is probably going to end up being the future of that company. So with that, um, if there are questions, I'm open to taking those, uh, but I would like to put up contact information uh, on the screen. Uh, the best way to get in touch with me is to connect on LinkedIn. You can scan this QR, cro QR code. Uh, that will get you out to my LinkedIn contact and uh, we can uh, connect there and have at a discussion. I, I love to engage with folks. And with that, I'm going to end my slideshow and stop sharing. So Kinsley, you, are Dan. there any can questions? You I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Thanks for such a wonderful presentation.